Good morning, George. Good morning. It's great having you here in Calcutta. Oh, it's always a pleasure to be back. And here. and and uh, it's great giving us the opportunity to pick your brains. Ah, my pleasure. Uh, I'll try. I have prepared the questionnaire for you, so that we don't go haywire all over the place. Right. So uh, I'll uh, refer to you as a mountaineer, sure. As a scientist, as an author, historian, as a teacher, and a mentor. So I'll try and cover all the aspects. Okay. Uh, well, starting chronologically, right. which came first, you being a mountaineer or you being a high altitude researcher? Being a mountaineer. I, uh, I got my start with climbing uh, back near my home uh, in Ohio in the USA where I grew up. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I grew up in the flatlands uh, of the uh, United States Midwest, uh, I was introduced to rock climbing in my mid-teens, okay. and uh, that really launched me off on uh, uh, climbing bigger things uh, mm -hmm. several years later, so that by the time I was 20 years old, I'd, I'd climbed uh, uh, Mount McKinley or Denali mm -hmm. in Alaska, mm -hmm. and uh, so the, the years from 15 to 20 were sort of a build-up to the bigger, the bigger mountains. Mm -hmm. After you started, let's say, your science, mm -hmm. so would you, would you call it uh, one part is pleasure, the other business? Well, uh, many times that is the case, but I've had, uh, well, let's say I've always tried to take advantage of opportunities to have an intersection of those two. For instance, um, when I was uh, a clinician, I was spending summers on uh, Mount McKinley or Denali mm -hmm. in Alaska. It, by that time, it had been 10 years or so had elapsed between my first climb on, on Denali and, and this point, but I was working for the National Park Service so as a, uh, a clinician nice. and uh, basically working on their high altitude rescue patrols uh, where we'd, we'd patrol between 14,000 and 20,000 feet, and mm -hmm. Denali being 20,320 feet or 6,194 meters, and while it's not necessarily high by Himalayan standards, it sits at a latitude of a little higher than 62 degrees north of latitude, so it's quite cold, mm -hmm. and the proximity to the uh, Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea uh, makes it uh, just a cauldron for storms and mm -hmm very cold weather because of its uh, latitude. And Denali being the highest mountain in North America, it attracts many, many people each year, about mm -hmm. 1,500 climbers mm -hmm. each year. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of them are relative novices and mm -hmm. many of them get into trouble. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and much of the time that trouble involves uh, <laughs> medical pathology so the, the patrols that go out usually include, uh, you know, professional climbers as well as uh, mountain rangers and uh, a medic or two to, to handle the, uh, uh, the, the medical problems that come up. But everybody mm -hmm. on the patrol has to be a, a, a trained a mountaineer mountain. who is familiar w with operating in those harsh climates mm -hmm. at high altitude. Mm -hmm. So that, that uh, I guess, was my first... Uh, opportunity that I had to really blend the professional and the uh, uh, the mountaineer in me to sort of bring those two together and that that encouraged me to go on uh, that uh, experience on, on Denali uh, working on the uh, high altitude search and rescue patrols really encouraged me to go on to do more research in uh, uh, hypoxia or uh, conditions that result in uh, low blood oxygen. And um, yeah, I, I, I went on, got a, a PhD, mm -hmm. um, and um, my research focus uh, since then has been, uh, to some extent, um, high altitude physiology and medicine, but uh, moreover, other diseases that uh, have a more common clinical correlation with pathologies you see in. Uh, in everyday healthcare, such as Correct. sleep apnea yeah. or lung disease or that sort of thing. On an expedition where you have planned to do some field research, mm -hmm. how do you reconcile your climbing ambitions and your research? 
Well, that's a very good question because uh, if you're going on a Himalayan climbing expedition, uh, it's, it's very easy to try to do too much. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you're trying to do research and focus on the climbing, I find that that is often... Uh, um, Both of them suffer? Both of them suffer. That's a good way to put it. And uh, I've had more success when I've gone on expeditions where the focus was uh, high altitude physiology and medicine rather than the climb. Rather than the climb. Um, then I've, you know, I've sort of learned this over time that if you want to go climbing, go climbing. Don't try to do a, a lot of other things in addition to that, mm -hmm. such as the uh, such as the science. Mm -hmm. And I've been to Everest three times, twice for scientific expeditions and uh, once for climbing and uh, you know on a big Himalayan mountain like that you can't really do everything you successfully. You can't do justice to both. You have to, as in many things in life, you have to be willing to focus, focus. Yeah. and uh, certainly on a, a big challenging peak uh, in the Himalayas if you try to multitask too much you're sort of doomed to failure. Given the fact that you're hypoxic yourself well, for for starters, that's right. Uh, uh, you know, when you're when you're operating all the time at altitudes over five thousand meters, you're uh, mentally and physically not hitting on all cylinders. Mm. You know, I don't know if that's uh, a good analogy to a, a rough running automobile, but uh, uh, even though people do adapt uh, successfully at altitude for the most part, you know, given sufficient time for acclimatization, you're never really uh, the same person you are at sea level mm -hmm. at five, six, seven, eight thousand meters. And uh, science has shown us that uh, most lowlanders can adapt up to, say, five thousand meters elevation without significant deterioration over weeks. But once you start uh, getting much above five thousand meters, and in the Himalaya that's not hard because mm. Uh, many of the Himalayan peaks are much higher than 5,000 meters. The acclimatization can go on, but deterioration starts to creep in. Yeah. So the higher, at the very highest altitudes, six, seven, eight thousand meters, um, you are going down. You're consistently deteriorating yeah. physically yeah. and uh, and and mentally, even while you may still be continuing to acclimatize. So. Um, well, that may seem a contradiction in terms. It's a physiological uh, reality. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why going uh, to extremely high altitudes and, and trying to do too much is, is asking really too much of yourself. And it almost, I've learned, dooms your efforts to, to failure. In other words, if you want to go climb a peak, a hard, demanding peak, make that your focus. Okay. Now... Um your experimental subjects on a climb, mm -hmm. your fellow climbers, um, do you have to give them incentives or they readily agree to be prodded and pricked well, that, and blood gas sampled? Yeah, that depends. Um, it, like uh, on some of the expeditions I've done, uh, scientific expeditions, the, uh, uh, many of the, the fellow members have been scientists or, or physicians themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, they understand what's going on and, you know, uh, putting a needle in their femoral artery is something they're willing to put up with, mm -hmm. for instance. Uh, uh, in, in they're willing to deal with the risks involved. But those are typically at the very higher altitudes where mm -hmm. um, doing everything, every, everything is hard. Mm -hmm. Putting your boots on in the morning is hard. Mm -hmm. Turning over in bed is hard. Uh, so doing, uh, doing um, research, of course, is, is going to be hard as well at those altitudes, and it's hard work not only for the researcher but for the subjects. Mm -hmm. Where I've found, uh, you know, if, and, and of course under those circumstances you can't collect data on large numbers of people because... Uh, there aren't really, large number of people no, up there. That, right, there mm -hmm. aren't, you don't have a big pool of subjects, mm -hmm. maybe just a half a dozen climbers. At, at altitudes up to, say, base camp, though, we've used uh, trekkers mm -hmm. uh, who, who, for instance, will uh, trek into Mount Everest base camp on the Nepalese side. And uh, 
one in one instance we had nearly 200 truckers mm -hmm. come in over a three month period. In other words, I was resident at or above the altitude of Everest Space Camp for about three months, and a whole succession of truckers would come through to the 5,300 meter base camp, and. Uh, you know, they we would consent them like normal research subjects, mm -hmm. and uh, they would participate and then uh, trek on back to Kathmandu for their two week holiday. Um, and uh, so it, it can it can go both ways where where you're using your fellow climbers or fellow scientists as subjects, mm -hmm. or uh, outside uh, truckers in a, uh, a mountaineering uh, expedition who only come part way to the mountain, but or at high enough of an altitude for some of these important physiological uh, uh, changes to be taking place that we can measure. Well, uh, if you're going back in history, mm -hmm. let's say as far back as Kelas and Finch, right. and down history now there's Professor George Rodway. How do you place yourself in this continuum of high altitude medical research? Well, that's a very good question and uh, probably uh, not a necessarily easy question to uh, to answer. I uh, I hesitate to to compare myself to the, to the likes of Alexander Kellis or 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 George Finch, who were who were not only uh, high altitude mountaineering pioneers, but uh, pioneering uh, scientists as well. I. <laughs> In my mind, uh, those people are, uh, are are really my heroes, and the conditions with which they had to deal out in the field are, are somewhat uh, different than uh, we we have to deal with in the field now. I mean, our knowledge of uh, of the geography of the problems involved with the physiology and medical issues are much more advanced than. Uh, the pioneers uh, had to deal with in the earliest earliest part of the uh, 20th century. I mean, many times just finding the mountain uh, in in trying trying to get up it was so difficult for them because uh, uh, the gear they had was so rudimentary compared mm -hmm. to what we have today. Their knowledge of things we take for granted right. today, like uh, you know, basic basic uh, things like. Uh, staying hydrated enough mm -hmm. and uh, acclimatization and deterioration at high altitude they they were just at that time early in the 20th century where they were just probing the boundaries of those things and they didn't have a, a very full comprehension of them so to compare what we're doing today uh, with them is is uh, you know um, is a difficult comparison I'd rather see it as more standing on the shoulders of giants uh, with with what we've done today. I mean, everything we do in science and in medicine and mountaineering is is standing on the shoulders of our predecessors. We weren't the first people to consider doing this route or that that route or uh, looking at this scientific or medical problem. Uh, people have often wrestled with these things for for ages. And uh, we're, we now have the tools and knowledge based on what they did decades ago to go forward and uh, continue building on, on their work. So, I mean, I like to think that uh, that's what we've done. And from a historian's point of view as well, um, I like to think I'm, I have a, a, perhaps a better appreciation than uh, both a lot of people in medicine or mountaineering about uh, what has happened over uh, these many years and un unfortunately uh, uh, many people in medicine and mountaineering don't have much of an appreciation for uh, the historical precedents and one of the things that I see uh, that I can do as an educator is uh, not only educate people uh, today about some of the hazards of going to for instance high altitude but educate them about uh, about their 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 uh, predecessors and uh, the important work they did to uh, provide today what we often take for granted in the way of uh, knowledge and uh, enhanced technology. In other words, these things, knowledge and so forth, it doesn't drop off of the trees. 
mm. it's it's hard won mm -hmm. over a very many years mm -hmm. and um, unfortunately uh, human beings are uh, 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 have a short-term memory. They have a short-term memory and they're all always a little too ready to forget uh, about their uh, uh, historical uh, uh, ancestors, if, mm -hmm. if you will. They, mm -hmm. they, people like to think that they're the first ones who had that idea. Uh, this is the first time in history that anybody's wrestled with this. Mm -hmm. The old saying that there's very little new under the sun is, is in fact true. And the reason we have the successes today we have in, in many fields, uh, in exploration or medicine, is directly linked to uh, the work of our predecessors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, your studies uh, in both mountaineering history and science. Would you think that the 1953 Everest expedition was the turning point where people reconciled themselves to the use of oxygen on high peaks? That the debate finally rested. I, I think uh, I think that is uh, a, a pretty accurate statement. Um, if you look at the the run up to 1953 uh, in the debate around using oxygen at altitude, no one had provided any, uh, shall we say, hard scientific data mm -hmm. of its efficacy or effectiveness prior to prior to the early 50s because the, uh, the British physiologist Griff, Griffith Pugh, oh, mm. who was uh, a, a scientist who accompanied the 1953 Everest expedition, had done important laboratory work back in Great Britain mm -hmm. as well as field work in the year or two prior uh, to the Himalaya, collecting data on just how effective supplementary oxygen was in, in climbing at, uh, at high altitude. So, in, in many ways, he provided the first really extensive, reliable data to show that, uh, uh, you know, if you want to if you want to move faster at altitude, if you want to stay warmer, for instance, you're going to Need be well served oxygen. by supplementary oxygen. Now, uh, which certainly doesn't mean that everyone who climbs it needs it, but the vast, vast majority would. Of people who want to do it with any degree of safety need to do that and I, I, I remain convinced to that to this day there just aren't that many people in the world for instance who are uh, either native lowlanders or native highlanders who have the capability to climb to the very highest summits with enough gas left in, in the tank yeah. when they reach the summit to make that, it safely back. To make it safely back and deal with any contingencies, okay. such as bad weather. Right. So I've seen too many instances on, for instance, on Mount Everest, people who want to try to climb it without supplementary oxygen. They're, they're not, they may be trying to climb it without uh, supplementary oxygen, but they're doing it in a way that defies the traditions of mountaineering in the sense that they're having, uh, they've got a team of Sherpas carrying all their gear, mm -hmm. essentially, lead, you know, one in front of them, one behind, and, uh, and the, 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 the people are, um, you know, they're all but crawling on their knees mm -hmm. at like 27,000 feet or, you know, somewhere around 8,200 meters. And they, 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 wouldn't, they couldn't, they can't carry their own gear, and if they had to make important decisions, they're mentally gone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and they're having a very hard time staying warm because uh, the human machine, it's it simply, uh, the, the human metabolism does not work very well in such a hypoxic uh, environment. So, uh, there's really, uh, <laughs> I think, very few people who have the, uh, uh, the right genetic stuff to be able to climb to an altitude such as the summit of Everest without supplementary oxygen and still have any reserve left for dealing with uh, any kind of emergency or contingency. So, so would you conclusively say that in 52 the Swiss failed and 53 the British were successful because of better science? Because well, in I, no way that the Britishers were better mountaineers than the correct. Swiss. Yeah, I think it, it stands to reason that the Swiss team was 
probably uh, had many more experienced alpine climbers on it than the British team did in 53. But uh, what really uh, decreased the chances of Swiss success in 1952, you remember they, they were on the mountain um, in the spring of 1952 as well as the fall of 1952. Yes. And in both instances, their oxygen gear was uh, inferior to, the to what the British were using. Mm -hmm. um, Griff Pugh, the physiologist I mentioned a moment ago, had identified what was perhaps the, uh, the best open circuit oxygen rig uh, then in existence, and that basically it was World War II technology that they brought forward for mm -hmm. mountaineering use. Mm -hmm. They were the British were also testing a closed circuit oxygen rig mm -hmm. uh, that uh, Berdillion and Evans climbed to the south summit with mm -hmm. uh, before it stopped working, uh, like a day or two ahead of Tenzing and uh, and Ed Hillary's success on May 29, 1953. But um, long story short, it was the 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 technology. Uh, and the efficacy of the oxygen systems that allowed them to, the British to succeed where the Swiss failed. And, uh, but Griff Pugh and his associates had provided the scientific uh, rationale for the use of that so that the team was, I, I'd say, pretty fully on board with the use of supplementary oxygen as the way to achieve the summit in 1953. Going back to the 53 expedition, John Hunt's book on the ascent of Everest. Do you think he has done a grave injustice to Griffith Puke? Well, I would not say it was a grave injustice. I would say it was more uh, a matter of not really giving Griff Pugh and science its due, its proper due, in the sense that I think John Hunt wanted to sell the 1953 climb as a uh, a triumph of the human spirit of the the, the British spirit the British spirit okay. right ah. and uh, you know as with most European countries after World War II Britain you know post-war Britain uh, was still on the ropes you know mm -hmm. to use a boxing mm -hmm. analogy mm -hmm. uh, you know people were living in very austere conditions mm -hmm. and uh, British uh, you know, I think British morale was uh, kind of low in the in the years uh, post World War II. Even though they were on the the winning side mm -hmm. uh, economically, it it delivered a powerful blow to uh, to Great Britain. And I think uh, you know the climb had royal patronage, for instance. Yes. So um, I think it was important for Hunt to sell the climb as a uh, as a triumph of the British spirit which it no doubt was. However, I think it's also true that Hunt failed to tell the full story mm -hmm. behind the 1953 climb and why they were successful where uh, their predecessors had not been successful. It wasn't because uh, the British team was full of superior individuals, mm. much better equipped to deal with that mountain than all of their predecessors some of which were British, mm -hmm. but they, and due to the thanks due to Griff Pugh and some of his associates, they knew some of these secrets mm -hmm. now about how the human body adapts. adapts to those altitudes and what it really, what the human body really needs to perform well at those altitudes. So, while while any mountaineering success or endeavor involves triumphs of the human spirit, we can't forget that there's certain basic scientific principles that that drive uh, what makes these successful, and we see that today in Himalayan climbing all the time, most of which uh, people don't pay any attention to because it's, it's just part and parcel, knowing that you have to stay hydrated, you have to stay warm. Um, you know, you, the acclimatization process doesn't happen overnight. Uh, all these things that we take for granted now came from much, much hard-earned knowledge over many, many years. And essentially what John Hunt had did, in my opinion, was just neglect the, the build-up of, of scientific knowledge that had led them to the success they had in 1953. Mm -hmm. uh, going a little bit 
a little bit further back, 21, 22, and 1924. Would you think that the uh, Everest Committee again did a big mistake in not taking Finch? Well, I think when Finch was rejected for the 1924 uh, uh, British Mount Everest expedition, uh, it was done primarily because he was seen as uh, something of a divisive figure. Um, having done the study of Finch uh, that I have, I realized that uh, um, he was a very plain-spoken individual. He was mm -hmm. a scientist, he was a chemist, mm -hmm. physical chemist, but uh, he was a person who tended to tell it like he saw it, mm -hmm. and uh, which as we know from our own experiences, is not always politically the best thing, thing to, to do. do. Uh -huh. um, he was very straightforward with the truth. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and people who are often very straightforward forward with the truth... It can be abrasive to people who don't appreciate it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, very abrasive. So he was seen as an abrasive character, no doubt. But he was an excellent alpinist. He mm -hmm. was trained in, uh, in the Alps of Europe, a better climber, no doubt, than even George Mallory. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm convinced of that. Um, and, and, of course, he did a lot of work on the 1922 oxygen system, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, the, the British went to school on in, mm -hmm. in 1924 mm -hmm. when the uh, uh, 24 oxygen system, they actually had Finch working on the 24 oxygen system and uh, sort of gave him his, uh, his letter of rejection fairly soon before the 24 expedition went out. But, you know, uh, beyond that weighing of his, his obvious talents and his, his uh, perceived abrasiveness was the fact that, you know, in, uh, in 1920s Great Britain, um, there, um, the British, particularly the English, still had a very imperial view of the world. And Finch was not upper crust, not the public school type? Right. And uh, Finch, Finch was born in Australia, Australia yeah. grew up in Australia and the continent. He, he moved to continental Europe from Australia when he was in his teens. So he was an outsider from the English establishment. Mm. So between his, his abrasiveness and his being an outsider from the English establishment, uh, that seemed to more weigh against them than on the other side of the scale his talents uh, were able to compensate for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in the whole weighing of, of the uh, uh, inclusion or exclusion of him from the 1924 team, the powers that be decided that his talents were outweighed by his, abras his abrasiveness <laughs> And the fact that he wasn't one of the old boys from the the English upper crust establishment, mm -hmm. I think, much to the uh, uh, much to the detriment of the 1924 team. Yeah. Obviously, he would have uh, been in an important inclusion as uh, for climbing talent. But as with any mountaineering expedition, um, you know, if the members don't gel yeah. together, and I think perhaps rightly they were they were concerned about that, but uh, it's, it's, you know, it's very easy for us to sit here in the 21st century and second-guess those things, uh, decisions, decisions that were made nearly a hundred years mm -hmm. ago in a cultural context that we can hardly understand today. Mm -hmm. Staying with 1924, uh, do you think Mallory's perceived underperformance during the Great World War, or what he thought was his underperformance, made him a fatalist and maybe the final uh, decision to go ahead as far as he did with Irvin? Um, I mean during the World War many of his best friends died. Right and uh, I, it has oftentimes occurred to me whether uh, Mallory and every survivor of the Second World War had uh, some significant, significant degree of survivor guilt or what we call today survivor guilt, mm -hmm. where uh, many, of, many of his comrades in arms uh, didn't make it through the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that degree of survivor guilt may have been present in many of the team members who 
had uh, participated in military service mm -hmm. during the Second World, or pardon me, the First World War. So uh, I think, unless you've been through that experience yourself, it's hard to fully comment and pass judgment on them. And pass judgment on that, but uh, I, I've noticed in just my own experience with. Uh, uh, veterans of uh, uh, the recent Iraq and Afghanistan conflict uh, in the American military that uh, there's a fair degree of survival, survival guilt and there's a, a fair degree of fatalism on, on, on their part about why they survived, their friends didn't. And uh, I think that colors uh, the rest of their years. Mm -hmm. But that's, I think, part and parcel to any military veteran's experience of combat. I suppose so. Um, a oft uh, asked question, I mean for ages it has been asked, from the available evidence, you think Mallory made it to the top? I, I tend to reject the idea that Mallory and Irvin uh, did get to the summit. Uh, the more I have uh, learned about the, uh, uh, the climb and studied it and so forth, I don't think they probably made the top. Um, given the uh, understanding of human physiology at the time and knowing how probably how dehydrated they were um, and knowing that uh, their oxygen systems were rudimentary and they probably ran out of oxygen uh, before they would have the been in a, a position to reach the top. I, I think they turned around on that day uh, when the, the snowstorm, the afternoon snowstorm came in that uh, uh, Noel Adele, who was also high in the mountain, reported uh, uh, Mallory and Urban last being seen on, uh, on the ridge near the second, second step. step. And of course people have debated whether they were actually able to climb the second step or not because of the technical nature. Of, of that step. So it's, it's very likely that uh, they turned around at or before the, uh, the second step. And, um, you know, given uh, the knowledge and skills of the day, I'd say just getting to the second step was an amazing uh, feat at that amazing point of time. Achievement. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of the, the people who have uh, uh, sort of lobbied for their succeeding on that climb probably or many of them are armchair mountaineers mm -hmm. and don't have a full appreciation uh, nor do they have a full appreciation of what Mallory and Irvin or uh, their colleagues of the day were dealing with with the equipment and the knowledge that they had I think achieving the summit in the 1920s uh, perhaps was possible but I think unlikely and the truth being known We'll really never know what what happened that day, mm -hmm. but uh, I'd have to say that the uh, facts, as I know them, would uh, argue against their the summit success that day. One last question on Mallory. Somehow Mallory has been an iconic status all over the world. Now his reply to a very ill-informed American reporter uh, at a point of time when he was quite disgusted and frustrated was because it's there. Now this, this phrase, because it's there, do you think it deserves the iconic uh, Zen mountaineering status that, is, that it has actually acquired? Well, I, I tend to think that that phrase uttered by Mallory in, I think, 1923 during his American mm, tour, tour yeah. uh, was, was really a, a flippant reply to the reporter. Uh, and knowing a little bit about Mallory's sense of humor, uh, he was a bit sarcastic at times uh, with his sense of humor, and I think that was an, a, a flippant, sarcastic reply uh, to that reporter. And you know, of course, reporters are often uh, uh, known for asking inane questions, and uh, perhaps he was he was tired of that. Uh, uh, but I so yes, I, I think um, the that remark has probably garnered more attention than it needed to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That answers my question. Now, if you fast forward to the present times, 
What are your comments on the circus we see on Everest each year? Well, <laughs> I could go on, but I'll, I'll try to keep that comment short. <laughs> um, having been to Everest uh, several times now, uh, calling it a circus is... Uh, Unfair? Uh, no, I, th I think it's quite accurate. Uh -huh. uh, it is quite accurate. Uh, I mean, the physiological challenge of, of Everest still remains today. It's still the highest piece of rock and ice on Earth. And uh, people who climb it are always sort of on the edge of their physiological envelope when they're climbing it. In other words, uh, people will continue to get into trouble and die on, on Mount Everest, uh, um, as we see every year. The mountain is, is still a respectable challenge any way you look at it. However, uh, the... Um, the present circumstances of it being primarily a commercial mountain for commercial climbers who are somewhat or sometimes very inexperienced means that it's sort of a, an abstraction of what I consider a traditional mountaineering experience. In other words, you can go to Everest today without knowing how to put your crampons on. Mm. And, uh, you know, the Sherpas will do that for you. So uh, the, the Sherpas who work the mountain uh, have, rightly or wrongly, come to see it as, as their piece of real estate. Uh, and uh, it's their workplace. And the, the, mount, the mountaineer, the western mountaineers or Indian mountaineers who, or any, anyone who, come, who comes there is just a, a visitor and the, the Sherpas are the gatekeepers of the peak and they they usher the the climbers through and provide them with a safety rail to the top mm -hmm. okay and uh, for anybody who came up uh, in a more traditional from a more traditional mountaineering background that's a disgusting that's, it's it's kind of a perversion okay a perversion of, uh, of the mountaineering uh, that we have uh, always thought tradition. of or maybe learned yeah so you know self-sufficiency for instance it can go right out the window mm -hmm. on, on Everest these days because you've got, you're paying people to look after you. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to avoid that mm -hmm. uh, to, to a large extent. So that's why I prefer really going to smaller out-of-the-way peaks in the Himalaya now that where I'm almost assuredly not going to see another soul outside of my own party. And that assures that we have to be self-sufficient. And it also assures me of a a uh, higher quality wilderness experience. Well, advances in science has made climbing Everest even easier and safer. True. Uh, has it also made it more dangerous uh, for the guides, given the fact that the novice climbers uh, wouldn't get to the top of their roof if you didn't give them a ladder? I think uh, there is a lot of truth in that assertion. That's right. Uh, by making climbing to those altitudes easier and safer, you, uh, you, you've you basically given inexperienced people this golden ladder to some place where they don't really belong. deserve to be, where they don't really belong. And as we see, when uh, to use a, a very coarse phase, or a coarse phrase, when the shit hits the fan mm -hmm. uh, high on that peak, that's where you see the problem really uh, uh, manifested with these inexperienced people. If they have to start looking after themselves to any extent, game over, mm -hmm. and they die like dogs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, mountaineering, at its essence for me and many of my colleagues, is taking care of your own problems, mm -hmm. not relying on the guides to do it for you because mm -hmm. it these uh, extreme altitudes, oftentimes the guides are at the edge of their own envelope, mm -hmm. and if things go wrong, they're very hard pressed to look after everyone mm -hmm. as they might be able to on a, a much lower peak. Mm -hmm. I have known somebody who came back from Everest uh, with five of his fingers gone, and I asked him, how did it happen? Uh, he was, uh, he didn't look very shame-faced. Uh, he said he forgot to put on his mitts. So that is the type of climbers we have on Everest these days. So I think uh, it's pretty, ha pretty hard on the guides. Yes, and uh, of course, 
people and are if, often... If a guy has a supervisor, a climber, putting on his mitts, right. that's, that's, that's a bit too much. Well, many of the clients going to Everest nowadays do need somebody almost as a handmaiden to, to watch out for everything they do. Uh, and uh, again, for me and many of my friends, that's not mountaineering. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, many of these clients today in uh, Everest and similar Himalayan peaks, 8,000 meter peaks, are paying big money. Huge money. Huge amounts of money. To, to go to these peaks, and uh, many times it, they quickly get in over their head, and the guides say, "Yeah, you've got to. This is it. You've got to turn around." And uh, for some of the clients, it's difficult to convince them of that because they think they've paid their money. Mm. I want to get up there, mm -hmm. you know, and they're not realizing that the guide has their best interest in mind uh, when the guide says, "You've had enough. You've got to turn around." Do you think the newer rules that the Nepalese government are trying to promulgate, uh, will those rules stick and will they make a difference that only qualified climbers are going to be allowed? I mean, uh, it's, it's going to make a huge economical uh, difference to the Sherpas. Well, I think it will be a very difficult set of regulations to enforce if in fact it becomes the law, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. Enforcing it would be extremely difficult and it would, as you say, have extreme economic impacts mm -hmm. on the climbing industry in Nepal. So I think the, uh, the people whose livelihoods would be affected, such as the Sherpa community, would probably frown upon that mm -hmm. because many of them are making a pretty good living oh, yes. off of what they're doing. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. From your early days in the Himalayas, when you have climbed with the Sherpas and maybe what you have read about them, um, the Pasang Dawalamas and the Pasang Kikulis and the present generation of Sherpas. Both of them were exposed to, let's say, Western influence. Uh, do you see any difference? Yes and no. And I'll try to give you a short answer to what I mean there. Uh, I mean, I've climbed with uh, many different Sherpas over the years and uh, if, if you're talking about uh, doing routes, for instance, in the Indian Himalaya on lesser known peaks with Sherpas, it's really not much different today. Um, you know, some Sherpas are, are keen mountaineers themselves and they mm -hmm. like to climb. Others only do it because it's a livelihood. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that continues today as it's always been. But um, in, in, in certainly, too, in, in many parts of Nepal, uh, where there's not big money, involved in, uh, in the Sherpas being involved in mountaineering. It's more of a traditional, uh, uh, more of what I'd say something that we, I'd seen 30 or 40 years ago in the Himalaya where, you know, the Sherpas are part of the team. Yeah, they're, uh, they're hired by the expedition, but they're, they're full members of the climbing expedition and they're making some money, making a livelihood. Uh, but uh, very different than the scene you see on Everest and some of the other 8,000 meter peaks where the Sherpas are making quite good money mm -hmm. and uh, they, they see any threat to that, that livelihood and uh, access to the money and the, the goods that they can sometimes acquire. And let's face it, on a, a climb like Everest, they see uh, many wealthy Westerners or Indians or what have you who, who come with big amounts of money, you know, all the latest gear. They may have no mountaineering experience, but they've got money. They've got all, all, the, all the things that they, they need. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Sherpas feel like, well, this is the golden goose, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, as often happens with uh, large amounts of money, in, in, in human beings, money corrupts. Mm -hmm. Money corrupts, and unfortunately, I think there are some in the Sherpa community who have been somewhat corrupted by the money involved. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, far from trying to degrade the Sherpas, the Sherpas are only human beings. Yes. And uh, any human being is uh, apt to be corrupted by money mm -hmm. if money is the 
soul driving force in what you're doing, mm -hmm. it, it, it sort of gets the better of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, un unfortunately, Sherpas are no more resistant to that, uh, as we've seen, than, than other human beings are. So that's one reason why I say uh, Mount Everest and peaks like that have taken on a bit of a circus atmosphere where biz it, you know, it, it's big business driving what's going on in commercial climbing and not what I'd say is uh, traditional mountaineering. Would you think that explains the nearly fatal fight that Simon Moro and Uli Stake had with the Sherpas? Well, actually, when you ask your preceding question, that's the first thing that came to my mind, uh -huh. is that, that fight uh, between the Sherpas and the Westerners in uh, the spring of 2013. Uh, I had seen something nearly like that break out on the north side of Everest in 2011 when I was climbing the North Ridge. Uh, one of the uh, one of the guides actually had accused the a couple of the Sherpas of something, mm -hmm. uh, which they they may or may not have been guilty of. But instead of a civil conversation, they were uh, many of the Sherpas were extremely agitated mm -hmm. to be accused of something like this, and. Uh, so yes, I think uh, some of what I spoke to a moment ago does uh, um, does explain some of the background to why this uh, this potential west versus east conflict has has happened on peaks uh, on peaks like Everest. Extremely unfortunate, um, but. Um, it, it does seem to be a, a clash of cultures generated by the dollar being the bottom line. Money. Do you think we shall see a return of the Kela style perfected by Shipton and Tillman? Well, as much as I, I would like to think uh, that will become the predominant uh, style in the future, I, I don't think that will be the case for the most part. I think the uh, the Shipton Tillman model will be pursued only by the hardcore mountaineers in the mm -hmm. future, like mm -hmm. it was uh, nearly a hundred years mm -hmm. ago. The hardcore mm -hmm. uh, mountaineer, the the commercial climbing, I think, will continue to grow, um, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. Well, a little personal question: uh, in the distant future, and may that be a long time coming. When you finally decide to hang up your boots and maybe put away your syringes and oximeters and maybe not think of another research into another book, how would you look back on your career, uh, looking at it as a mountaineer, as a science researcher, as a historian and author? Right. Uh, what do you think would have given you the most pleasure? I mean, I know that's a difficult thing to answer, but... Uh, no, I think I can answer that question. Uh, is you know, I've already seen some evidence of that. Uh, I'm 56 years old now. Oh, you don't and, look it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, you know, not not quite in, in as good a shape as I was 20 or 30 years ago. So I am slowly slowing down. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, once the climbing is over with and. Uh, hopefully, I can con continue to write and so forth for 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 many years. But uh, I think, in the long run, what I'd like to see as my greatest accomplishments was um, educating people about the history of of these great peaks and uh, educating people about the uh, uh, the hazards that lay there in the peaks, the physiological and, and medical hazards mm -hmm. that climbers should go, f f for which the climbers should go forearmed with knowledge about. Mm -hmm. And toward that end, uh, I participate, for instance, as vice president of the uh, UIAA mm -hmm. Medical Commission mm -hmm. that serves to educate trekkers and climbers about the hazards of, uh, of high altitude, I think. That's a, an opportunity for me to give back to both the climbing uh, community and, and the, uh, the medical community and the public at large. I think 
when any educator, you know, which I am by, by profession, uh, looks hard at what they do and why they do it, it, it's basically to serve other people. Passing on hard on knowledge. Sure. That's, that's absolutely right. And it's, it's not about me. The older I get, the, the more I realize it's not about me. But it's, it's what I can leave people with that, that has real value. Mm -hmm. I'm sure people will look up to you as a, as a mentor. Uh, as far as you are concerned, have you uh, idealized uh, maybe a mountaineering scientist or scientist mountaineer who has influenced your style? Well, yeah, I think when you, when you ask that question, I immediately think of someone like uh, Alexander Kellis, mm -hmm. uh, who, of course, uh, died in 1921 on the first British Everest reconnaissance mm -hmm. expedition. But uh, Kellis, even though we're separated by culture and a hundred years, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I feel a certain kinship with him, which is why I uh, uh, came up with the idea of, of writing his on biography. him and writing his biography. Is, you know, he was a, a tremendously influential mountain explorer in the early part of the 20th century, as well as a tremendously influential scientist who started to, to probe the, uh, the unknown in high altitude physiology and medicine. And that's sort of been the ideal for me. Kellis was, uh, um, you know, he, and he was an academic, Mm -hmm. as well, which, which I am. So, in a sense, uh, uh, maybe I'm modeling myself a bit on, on that Kellis model. I found that, you know, I, 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 I've always found him very impressive. Um, uh, yeah, with Kellis as an idol, uh, it's, there is very little to go wrong. Uh, in fact, he had the altitude record of one hurry. People thought uh, Trishul was the altitude record. But you have conclusively proved that it's wrong, and he had the altitude record. That's that's right. Um, people forgot that uh, uh, he had the altitude record. Uh, uh, he, his altitude record broke that of Tom Longstaff mm -hmm. just by a few meters. But mm -hmm. uh, he did have he did have the altitude record, I think, until uh, the British climbed uh, uh, Kamet in uh, 1931. Yes. yes. As a teacher, as a mentor. What would, what would be your primary advice to a young person learning his first knots? Well, I, I do have an opportunity to comment on that because I'm a co-director of the USA, USA's uh, Diploma of Mountain Medicine, and uh, which the Diploma of Mountain Medicine, in short, it, uh, it serves to train uh, uh, paramedics, nurses, physician assistants, physicians, Clinicians, in other words, healthcare clinicians, in in the art of mountaineering and mountain rescue. Uh, so it it it, uh, it it pays heed to both the medical knowledge, medical knowledge set to mountaineering purposes, as well as uh, mountaineering and uh, mountain rescue itself. So I think uh, what still drives me today. Uh, be it for the Diploma of Mountain Medicine or my own interest in, in mountain rescue, is that uh, mountaineers do need to look out for one another. It's, it's a hazardous undertaking. We should do our best to educate one another about these hazards so uh, people can continue to enjoy the heights and uh, a level of uh, self-responsibility when they're operating on the heights so that they can get themselves out of trouble when, when things go wrong. I mean, this is what separates uh, climbing and mountaineering from many other sporting activities, is that it is potentially very hazardous. And uh, the real, uh, I think I speak for myself as well as many other mountaineers, and when I say the real satisfaction it comes out of being able to take care of yourself in that potentially hostile environment and make good decisions that have oftentimes life and death consequences. So you think it's both a theoretical and a practical learning process which everybody should go through? Well, uh, 
It's probably not for everyone. <laughs> no, I mean uh, people who want to go to the high mountains. Oh, people who want to go to the high mountains. Yes, I think uh, many uh, many people who go to the high mountains uh, have very little basic medical knowledge uh, when they should, because oftentimes you are having to look out after uh, you know medical issues that come up e even though they don't have any formal medical training mm -hmm. they still need to know some uh, important uh, tenets of first aid or mm -hmm. altitude physiology and again uh, my uh, educational experience with the UIA Medical Commission speaks to this trying to educate uh, the mountaineering public to these things um, it would save a lot of lives and make a lot of people's experiences at a high altitude uh, much, much more pleasant. Much more pleasant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Professor Rodway, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank my, you so much. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs>